Hello, and welcome to part one of an introduction to the E-Class. Now by that I mean the cruisers. The Royal Navy had two. And I've divided the introduction into two potentially free parts. I say potentially free because it's 10 to 9 on Thursday morning. It goes live. I do live at 6 o'clock today. And honestly, it was too hot to record a city. No. So it's going to be how much I can get done before it gets too hot today. Um, how do I to say? Try and think of some way to keep this room cool during my live. Six o'clock. Otherwise, you might be seeing me, uh, well, in what was almost a bilge pump style on a Tuesday of minimal top, let's put it. Of the shading of the scaffolding, but uh, hey, let's allow me to open the window fully. But that's enough about me. The class. E-Class cruisers, HMS Emerald and HMS Enterprise, two very different systems. They really were. Um, it's one of the interesting things, the three books I've been using for today's. Norman Freeman's British Cruisers. Warship Camouflage of World War II, Volume 3, which is Malcolm Wright's Cruisers, Nine Layers and Armed Merchant Cruisers. It's fairly cool. And of course, my old standby, MJ Whitley's Cruises of World War II and Encyclopedia. They're good. They're fun books. So, bilge pumps. Ay, caramba. There are so many memes that appear, but honestly, I enjoy this one because, well, there are some potentially interesting things coming up, like, uh, potentially, Bilge Pumps crew might be making some special appearances in virtual events, potentially. There's been some initial inquiries, and I've passed it on to the boys, so we'll see. We'll see, the, the crew will consider it. As I consider most things, probably from the perspective of, will there be iron brew? Will there be food? And, part of the professionalization thing. Where else to find me? Twitter, Patreon, and Global Maritime History. Patreon, it's three pounds a month. On a more serious note, please do share and like the videos if you like them. Um, as I've admitted in some videos, and hopefully... Some of you will know. No, uh, I'm a contract university lecturer, which means technically I'm unemployed for the summer now because I'm only in a 10 month contract with the, with the universities I work for. Usually, that doesn't matter to me. Usually, I have plenty of summer work going off and teaching GCC and A level revision, doing all sorts of archive trips, and all these sort of things, and you know. Really, you know, working for the summer, but it's fun stuff. Of course, this year I can't do that. So whilst I'm not spending a great deal, let's be honest, I'm living at home. I'm also not earning anything. So technically, YouTube is my income for the summer. And so technically, therefore, I have to professionalize it because it is. So that's why I've done this stuff. Right. Conception. Okay, so every single generation of these cruisers gets better. You have the Cs, which are the most common ones. The Bs, which as we all know, were arguably the most potentially upgradable ones 
in World War II that didn't get upgraded because of the time and the ease. Which come to an extent semi-upgraded already. That's the really interesting thing about the ease. But their conception really is something as... Well, the C's and the D's were about fleet operations. The C's were about your cruisers in the melee. Your cruisers for fighting in the North Sea. Your D's were about your scout. Your E's... They're about dealing with surface raiders. Basically, they're built with the lessons of Glasgow from the Battle of... Um, well, all the battle, uh, all the various battles of the Falklands and the Battle of um, Coronel in mind. What she got up to, how she dealt with it, all these things are a factor in her design. Sorry, my little marker in the book, a little piece of yellow paper, had managed to fall out. So, no. Weirdness really does happen. To an extent, the E class were a response to some German construction, but that can be overblown, because by this point, the Royal Navy both knew that the German construction was pretty much pointless, and technically the German construction is of under construction in 1917, but these are laid down in September and June 1918, they're launched 1920, 1919, and they are completed in 1926. In the nicest way, if these were a reaction to German cruisers, which A, were a myth, a myth before they even began, they were paper tigers, B, were started pretty much towards the end of World War One. and not completed till more than halfway through the 1920s, eight or so years after World War I finished, I don't think they can claim to be reactions to German cruisers produced in 19... Uh, but these German cruisers, mythical cruisers in 1917. So when people start to say this to me, I do get a look at them a bit funny. Those cruisers didn't exist. By the time you're making most of your design decisions, and let's be honest, most of them will be made between... Well, whilst they're launched in 1919 and 1920, the fact they're not completed for seven and six years, sort of, means they are, a lot of decisions are made in that time. The holes are launched. Interesting enough about that installation, they have, they generate 80,000 horsepower. And the way they do this is they have two Shakespeare class destroyer sets they put in them. So that each one generates 40,000 horsepower, which gives them 80,000 ship horsepower overall. And this is really quite cool because it gives them a range of 8,000 nautical miles at 15 knots. But more importantly, it gives them a top speed. of 33 knots. Sorry. The piece of yellow paper had then blocked the 33 knots. They're good ships. And HMS Emerald is the purest example of the class. Euphrates is never built. So, there's an interesting discussion going on in Discord at the moment about what would have happened if the Irish Free State, when it had been set up, nah. 
had decided to build a navy and been very friendly with Britain, well, Euphrates could have been their cruiser. They could have had an E-class. It would be nice to have had an E-class in the RN. Next to E-class. They were useful ships. Edris Emerald goes to the East Indies. That's the Indian Ocean Squadron. A fourth cruiser squadron on commissioning in 1926, only returning to pay off in 1933. She spent seven years in the Indian Ocean. She's the newest cruiser in the Royal Navy in 1926, and she goes out there and spends seven years. And she takes part in a Nanking incident. And the Nanking incident is pretty darn cool if you're a naval, if you're someone who's stressing. Because if you're someone who's stressing naval power, Nanking incident is a classic example of that naval power being used. Now, I just want to clarify something. On Wikipedia, I have noticed some errors going around. So I'm going to explain a list of the task group sent. You have HMS Vindictive, a heavy cruiser, which is formerly. Uh, a sort of pseudo seaplane carrier, which is now armed with the good old 7.5 inch guns. You have light cruisers, Emerald, Carlisle, Caradoc. Destroyers, Witherington, Woolsey, Wishart, Veteran, Verity, and Wild Swan, W and Vs. Sloop, HMS Petersfield, technically a hunt class mine laying sloop, but in this role she's definitely acting as a sloop. Gunboats, Free insect class, Nat, Aphis, and Cricket. That is your task group you deploy under Reginald Turret. Now, the interesting thing is that force is comprised, as we've talked about in terms of war fighting for the China Station, from vessels taken from the China Station and the East Indies. So they've almost done a war footing deployment. These are the ships available, that immediately available. Boom, send them. Oh, they're East Indies, they're fine as sent. The Americans also send a whole load of destroyers. And how do I put it? How was well, this incident? How does it go? Well, on the 23rd of March 1927, there was an approaching army on Nanjing. Um, it belonged to Zhang Zhishong. Uh, well, no. He was the, the warlord defending the city. The It was the National Revolutionary Army who are under Shen Qing. Uh, they're sort of... <sighs> well... The National Revolutionary Army are, are the army of the Republic of China, really, sort of, in, in to an extent. Uh, they're one of the groups in China, one of the bigger armies, and they start, they approach Nanjing, Nanjing, Nanjing and uh, then... Well, the warlord retreats, withdraws his troops, and the NRA, which had a large contingent of communist soldiers, that's classified, but also just a large contingent of Chinese soldiers who were fed up with the uh, with the what they saw as foreign exploitation of the land, decided to go on a looting spree and killing spree. In response, the Royal Navy and the US Navy turn up en masse. And HMS Emerald opens fire. Um, basically, uh, uh, <laughs> the NRA soldiers find that they can't take on the combined high explosive rounds of machine gun fire from Emerald, Woolsey, and um, some American uh, destroyers.
And I just realized I forgot to mention the Italian as well. There was a um, Italian gunboat, the Carlotto, there. I was going, reading my notes, going, Carlotto? That's not a senior class crew. Oh, no, that's the Italian vessel. So, it's a large force which is deployed. You know, if you look at that, you've got four cruisers. You have six destroyers, so that's 75% of the flotilla. And another four sloop and gunboats. So you've deployed 14 ships. That's a big presence. That is the Royal Navy basically going, look at how much firepower we can employ. The NRA doesn't have enough to take it on. She stays out in the Far East and East Indies for another six years after that. And then she comes back to the UK. She's given a year-long refit in Chatham. Her boilers are cleaned. All sorts of things are done to make it better. And... Um, She's recommissioned for the 4th cruiser, cruiser Squadron again. She's only brought back in 37 when our good friend uh, from the Asama Maru incident, HMS Liverpool, is deployed out there. So HMS Liverpool goes to the East Indies first, and then she goes to the China Station. And she takes part in the Asama Maru incident. She's what replaces HMS Emerald out there. So, <sighs> no. So, Emerald's role out there was very much of presence maximization. She was a beautiful ship. She was a very capable ship for her size. She was a light cruiser, yes, but. That's why she was put in the East Indies rather than the Far East normally. Because if she's sitting in the East Indies rather than the China Station, she can rapidly react and be used in the China Station, as she was in the Nanking incident. But she's also not part of the permanent deterrence of China, of, well, Japanese, for, Imperial Japanese forces, American forces, and Chinese forces, the NRA. World War II, she's commissioned quite quickly. Um, she immediately does duties on the 12th Cruiser Squadron on Northern Patrol. And she starts that off in September 1939. So she is commissioned almost the moment war begins. She's going, hello, I'm ready for service. Um, but... She doesn't just do those duties. She is commanded by a very special captain, Augustus Agar, who will then she do stuff on the Dorsetshire and all sorts of other things throughout World War II. He is one of VC. He's a very special officer. He's not someone the Royal Navy is going to put in a unit which is not going to be seeing action or doing important things. He won a VC in the Russian Civil War using one of those early coastal torpedo boats. But they are so tiny. To attack... Well, he was aiming to get some Russian battleships. On the first time, he just finds a cruiser. He sinks the Soviet cruiser. He actually goes back again when he gets in more, to more torpedo boats as a group and does sink a couple of battleships. So the reason the Soviet Navy is in quite as bad a shape as it is in World War II is almost single-handedly down to um, Captain Augustus Egar. An interesting gentleman. Anyway, on the 7th of October 1939, Emerald takes part in the very special convoy sailing from England 
So no, that doesn't count. Every ship is carrying two million in gold. Two million pounds worth in gold. Has to pay for American equipment, American supplies, all sorts of things. Um, as part of it, they try. They, everyone was put into a tropical uniform to try and make people think they were going more far away. After all, she was normally a tropical ship. And they're basically forming up with two R-class battleships and her sister. And Caradoc. So, they had two, what, they must be R-class, our second line battleships. And three cruisers which are used to doing hot weather deployments, which are in the case of Caradoc and Emerald, are known features of the East Indies. In fact, it's not far to, it's not a strong stretch of the imagination to imagine that this would be a deployment to the East Indies at this time to stabilize British possessions over there. And also, it would be make sense, you know, where you're going to store the gold. India. Very sensible place to store gold. If they hear about gold, they move. Actually, they're heading to Canada, and what this causes great fun when they get there is they need to basically ask the Red Cross for more clothing to get their crews back. Because what little they did have aboard was um, used up, let's say, on the journey across. It was a harsh seascape. Uh, they lose all their boats, they lose all their depth charges, they lose their fairy sea fox. Pretty much... They look, almost everything gets wiped out by the heavy seas because they are fitted as if they're going back to tropical waters. It's a bit cruel. Um, they make it there. And then they have the job of escorting convoys back. Supposedly to um, scare off service raiders, but... Okay, whilst... I would have, um, I will give a fair chance to a Leander class versus a Deutschland class, um, especially if they're in numbers. Certainly a pack of town class, maybe a county even one on one, considering I just like the counties better. But let's say two on one. They definitely cause enough damage one on one, they'd have to head home. Even with all that, I, I, I'm not quite sure, as much as I love her, that HMS Emerald and her five, six-inch single guns would be that much of a deterrent to uh, a Deutschland class. As I understand it, though, it was they did also have a battleship with them, so um, frankly... There isn't much chance of a Deutschland class taking on the 15 inch guns of even an R class battleship because that would be a case of. Hello! You are something slow enough I can almost catch you, and I have very big, powerful weapons. She does this at least once more on, on 24 June 1940. Apparently, this time she takes 58 million in gold. Which is a lot, lot more. But also the value of gold had been affected, price of gold had been affected by war, so it, you know, there are caveats. And her sister Enterprise goes along for an, with another 10 million. So, you know, basically the E-Class are your gold transporting ships. And then... She returned, does actually return to the Far East. <laughs> 1941, she's transferred back to um, the Indian Ocean, East Indies. And guess which squadron she joins? Yep, it's back to her favourite fourth cruiser squadron. Then she takes part in the Middle East, um, Persian Gulf Operation in Iraq, and then... Here's the great thing. Emerald is still such a useful cruiser, still such a very viable and fast cruiser, 
that in 1941, when the Japanese attacked, she is made flagship of the FAST group. It either is a testimony to the quality of the ship built, and the class, and I need my morning iron brew, or it's a testimony to the lack of ships the British had out there. Frankly, though, I am rather pleased because this allows me to use even more, show that even more history would have backed up my own version of deployment when I was putting forward how I would have fought the Battle of Singapore. Fucking Supreme Commander. Right, so, we have some pictures from this book. So, I'm going to quickly disappear. See you in a second. So, as you can see, these are the different pictures, the many faces of HMS Emerald. There is her buff and white, which is actually from her second deployment. Her first deployment is over the page, and that actually has the buff going lower. So the Y turret is buff as well. But this time, for some reason, they decide not to. They decide that, frankly, there is enough buff. And so she is um, paint that particular turret is painted white, as is the lower ring. So basically, if you can imagine it, all the superstructure was painted buff and everything level of it. So there's a level below the current layer of buff was also buff. And that is a little fairy osprey she has. A little single-seat fighter. Um, she does seem to be it's a rather attached to the single-seater fighters on her catapults. Um, eventually, she gets a Sea Fox, which is not a single-seat fighter, but um, three of us two to that were the Flycatcher and the Osprey, seen here, on in the yellow at the top. And then eventually, of course, she... Um, gets her full American USN Kingfisher float plane, which she rather enjoys having. That's what she has in 1941 <coughs> and to 1943. She takes part in D-Day, she provides fire support support there, but she doesn't get used a lot. And in fact, she is a victim of the Royal Navy having new ships coming in and needing to crew them and not having a massively increase in crew because for some reason Britain had been prioritizing recruiting for the army after D-Day and even in the run-up to D-Day to an extent which meant the Royal Navy had a bit of a crew shortage because after the Royal Navy managed to stabilize the Battle Atlantic Whilst the government was not opposed to new recruits joining the Navy and was actually quite keen on it, um, they weren't, wasn't there preferential because they needed as big an army as possible to have the status that they needed in the campaign. It works out. To an extent. Anyway. Those are the many, many shades of HMS Emerald. And we're going to be discussing her more later on in the live. So, anyway, what do we have coming up? We have HMS Emerald and Enterprise today. We have Patreon 4 on Monday. What if the Singtar incident goes hot? The Battle of Tech Seal on the 1st of 20th and 25th. Could Crete have been saved in 1941? 27th, the Convoy War and Perfect Storm. Monday 31st. Mediterranean gunboat diplomacy. And as I said before, that has changed slightly. I've added in the Tangiers incident as a third incident because it just seemed to fit. Anyway, thank you very much. This has been 30 minutes. I'm going to see if I can't end it now. Thank you, because I'm trying to make the introductions a little bit more condensed. I'm trying.
Thank you.